here, bring an unusual message. Maybe you've never heard a message on uh, what I'm going to preach about today. Um, Isaiah chapter number 5, and uh, look at verse number 6. Isaiah chapter number 5 and verse number 6. And the Lord's talking here about how he's going to deal with a nation. And, and he's saying, I can do this and I can do that. And it, it speaks of his sovereignty that God's not only in control of the, of the planets and the universe, the weather and everything. He's in charge of all that kind of stuff. He keeps it all going. God does. Uh, Isaiah 5 and verse 6, he said, And I will lay it waste. It shall not be pruned or digged, but there shall come up briars and thorns. Look at this. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. He's talking to clouds. He said, I'm going to tell the clouds, don't rain. I don't care if it's 110%. It ain't going to rain. The Lord, one day he said, clouds, rain. Clouds, drop water. Clouds, don't rain. Cloud, don't rain. I'm going to preach this morning on the subject. He's the captain of the clouds. He's the captain of the clouds. Now, I don't know if you've ever heard a sermon about clouds, but like everything else, the Bible has a lot more to say about it than you might think. Actually, over a hundred, nearly 150 times, the Bible mentions clouds. Now, a cloud is a, a bunch of little teeny tiny droplets of water of vapor, all together. And then when you, when you see it in the sky, or if it's really low, you can actually get them drive through them in the mountains. Uh, what we would call fog is a lot of times like a cloud. And um, all put together. They bring beauty, but they bring rain. They bring snow. They bring hail. They bring tornadoes and sometimes are a sign of judgment. All these things are cloud. Now, there's about, there's really five or six different types of clouds. I know, uh, I, I remember studying it in school, actually, believe it or not, I remember that. Uh, when they taught us in school and I went back and looked over some stuff and there are basically those several groups, stratus, clouds, that means layer like when you see real uh, clouds that are like in layers or sheets, they're kind of low, they call them stratus. And then there's cumulus cloud, that means pile high on, or on heaps. And those are the clouds that look like cotton balls or like cotton candy, and they're beautiful, especially in the blue sky. You see those beautiful clouds like that, just, it just looks like you could just sit uh, on them, you know, and uh, like cotton balls or, or uh, cotton candy. And then there's cirrus cloud, cirrus like circle, curl, they're curled up, white clouds, very high, and then nimbus, and those are rain clouds, dark clouds, and then all the other clouds are combinations of those, those basic groups, and that's how science divides them up. But anyway, uh, God made them, and that's the first thing I want to say this morning. I'm going to talk about the creation of clouds. Did you know there wasn't any clouds when, um, as far as we know, when, when Adam and Eve were first created and God put them down in the Garden of Eden? Uh, there wasn't no clouds, and there wasn't no clouds for the first uh, uh, long time there, hundreds and hundreds of years, till, till Noah's time and Noah's flood came. As far as we know, all the, all the water the earth got, there was a mist that came up out of the ground and it had never rained until Noah's flood. And that's why people live to be seven, eight, nine hundred years uh, back there. Yes, it's literal. Yes, it's true. And uh, di dinosaurs, big animals and stuff uh, uh, before the flood because the, the whole atmosphere was different. When the flood came, Everything went a little cattywampus. I mean, it just knocked everything out of whack. And uh, there's some things in the atmosphere that uh, came down. And, uh, and the atmosphere changed. And personally, I think that might be when the earth got 
jilt, tilted on its axis and the days become 365 and one-fourth instead of exact 360 like it was to start with. That's my opinion. And we'll, we'll talk about that some other time. But anyway, uh, God made the cloud. And you know what the Lord did? The first mention of it there is in Genesis chapter 9. This is after the flood. And here comes Noah and his three boys, Shem, Ham, Japheth. They went out and populated the world. Everybody in the world came from one of those three boys. That's where the three races come from. Shem, Ham, Japheth. There's only three. And they, and they, uh, they populated the world. And we, we, uh, got, we see that the Lord looked there and he said, now, and I know it. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. He said, I ain't never, ever, ever going to do this again. And he said, uh, every time, from now on, it's going to rain now. But, and you're going to think it's going to flood this again. But I promise you, I'll never do it again. And you know what God did? He said, I will set my bow in the cloud. And there's the first mention of it. Isn't that something? You know, God didn't have to make clouds. He could have just made rain fall or come up out of the ground if he wanted to. He made clouds. I'm going to show you why this morning. Good Bible study. Uh, he said, uh, he said I, I will set my bow, that's the rainbow, in the cloud. And he said, when you see that rainbow in the cloud, that is not a sign that the LGBTQRSTXYZ community is fine. That is a sign that I will never, can't help it, it comes out once in a while. I mean, I'm a preacher, I'm not a politician, thank God. Uh, but I, he said, when I see that bow in the cloud, he said, that is a promise that I'm never going to destroy the world again by a flood. Thank God. I was in that motel the other day, and uh, you know I stayed in the famous Charlotte Hall Motel again. And uh, boy, I'm telling you, it's it right like normal. Uh, drug dealers coming around here and there, big loud cars at night. It gets wild in there at night. I ain't kidding you. And uh, I lock the screen door and lock the other door, and I leave my door open during the day and the screen door. And I, my uh, one thing I like about staying in a motel like that, I can open my door and right there is a, the trunk of my car. I ain't kidding you. I take one step and open, get my stuff out. I like that. Better than walking half a mile across the parking lot and going to elevators and everything. Uh, but uh, I heard this girl that works out there cleaning the room. She said, look at the rainbow. And I looked out. I could just, I was laying on the bed and just looked out there and I could see it. It rained all day. The first day I went, Thursday, I believe it was, flooded. But then that beautiful rainbow was in that cloud, was in that cloud. God created the rainbow and God made the cloud. Listen, if there were no clouds, we would need no faith. If everything was clear all the time and everything was sunshiny in our lives all the time, we wouldn't have to live by faith. But God let the bow be in the cloud there to let us know there is hope. And as, as the old uh, po poet said, every cloud has a silver lining. No matter how bad things are at your house, no matter how bad things are going in your life, no matter what kind of trials and difficulties you may be going through, no matter how bad it gets, no matter how bad the coronavirus gets, no matter how bad our country, the shape it's in, the clouds have a silver lining and we know that behind there is God and his promises are still good. Just as sure as he still puts a rainbow in the sky, the promises of God are still good, people. You can count on it. You can count on it. I mean, you can take it to the bank. The creation of the cloud. But let me say secondly, right quickly this morning, I want to talk about the pillar of the cloud. The pillar of the cloud. And that's there in Exodus chapter 13 and verse 21. Now, uh, the Bible said when God brought his people out of Egypt, he brought them out of there. Notice this. Look at this now. He said he brought them out of Egypt, and he said, look, I'm going to take you over in the land of Canaan. And it's a, it's a pretty good ways. Uh, we're going to be marching around here for a, a pretty long time. And you know what God did? He said, every day I'm going to lead you. And I'm going to put a pillar of a cloud to lead you every day. You follow that cloud. When that cloud moves, you move. When that cloud stops, you stop. I read about some famous cloud somewhere. I didn't, I didn't even know this, but I was studying this week, and I read about some cloud that stays still. You ever heard of a cloud stays still? You can look it up. Some of them are at that rock of Gibraltar or somewhere over there where it just comes up and forms every day, <laughs> and it's the same cloud. Maybe the Lord did one better than that. He put the cloud in front of them, and he said, when that cloud moves, you move. Now, he led them all day 
by a pillar of a cloud, and then at night, it was a pillar of what? Somebody tell me. Fire. And the pillar of fire uh, lit the camp at night, and the pillar of a cloud by day. You know what that means? That means that even though we can't see the Lord, even though it may be a cloudy time in our life, and I know, I know we're all, we're going through a cloudy time. Our whole country and churches are. I told them up there in, in Maryland this week, I said, it's so sad. Uh, it's knocked out. Uh, I, I would say most churches have lost 30 to 40% of their people during this pandemic we've had. 30 to 40%. You got about 10% that has just scared to come because they're afraid, and then you got another 30% that fell through the cracks because you can't stay out of church. Are you listen to me? You can't stay out of church and away from fellowship with God for months at a time and it not have a bad effect on you. And a lot of people just say, well, I'm just used to not going to church now. Heck with it. I just tell them. And there'll be people that'll never come back to church after all this is over with. And I tell you, we're living in cloudy times. We're living in cloudy times. Uh, the doctor's report might be bad. Uh, you may get a bad report from, uh, from your employer. He may tell you that you're going to lay you off. You may have health problems, and you will before it's over with. You may have problems of your health, and your health falls apart. But I'm so thankful thankful that even though the clouds are there, that he guides us and leads us and there's hope, there's hope, there's hope, there's hope. God's people were in Egypt's bondage. God sent Moses to lead them out and God led them. You know what? Did you know in Hollywood this morning, they have no hope? You ever, you ever, we ought to feel sorry for them people. The Bible said, envy not the wicked. I, it, it blows my mind that so many Christians look at Hollywood movie stars living like the devil and, and in them say, oh my goodness, she's got it made. Oh, look at, uh, look at um, uh, what's her name, Miley Cyrus, and, and look at, oh, oh gosh, they got it made. No, they've not got it made. No, they've not. I mean, I didn't get in bed at 4 o'clock this morning, got up at something, 7, 7.30 or something like that, and I guarantee you I slept better than she did last night. I will guarantee you. You know why? Because me and you have our feet on the ground. We know what's going on. The world don't know. They don't know. The world out there this morning, politicians, athletes, isn't it sad to see the way the athletes are just, are just crazy? They don't even know what they're doing. They're, in, they're ignorant in so many ways. The politicians, the world leaders in other countries have no idea. Thank God, me and you know what's going on, and we know the future. That's good. I remember when we went to, I went to uh, one of the times when I went to California. I, it might have been the time that Carrie and Todd went with me. I don't know. Was that the time we went to, down to Rodeo Drive and went shopping with, when y'all was with me? Or one time we went, and a preacher, I preached in, um, uh, over on the other, uh, San Pedro, which is just on the other side of the water there from Los Angeles. Actually, you can drive out there right by the church and look over the city of, of Los Angeles. He said, Brother Danny, uh, you want to go to Hollywood? And I said, sure. I want, sure. So we went, well, I, two or three times. And I said, I want to see that street where they, where they uh, got them... There are people's names in the sidewalk. And they said, that's, uh, I said, okay. So we walked down Hollywood Boulevard, and I tried, there's Frank Sinatra, you know, there's Hank Williams, uh, there's um, Lucy, you know, and there's uh, Andy Griffith, and there's somebody, and I thought, Lord, them people lived all their life and gave everything they had, and some of them died and went to hell, and all they get is people spit on their name, walk on it all day long. That's their life. I read about alfalfa. You remember alfalfa and the little rascals? Yeah. Poor old alfalfa. You know, uh, uh, he couldn't sing worth a lick, but it, it made it good. And, and uh, you know, let me call you sweetheart. Yeah. Like, you know, that little thing sticking up on his head and singing to Darla and trying to get her to fall in love with him. And I remember, and I, we used to love to watch alfalfa, and his name was... Uh, uh, Swats or Swats or something like that and I've seen a little documentary of his life and that poor old boy grew up and become a drunk and stayed drunk all the time and um, went to a guy's house a guy owed him $50 and him and another guy had gotten a fight over $50 and a man shot him and killed him 32 years old 32 years old 
And you hear other, the sad tragedy of Darla, the sad tragedy of Froggy, the sad tragedy of, I don't know whatever happened to Spanky. He might still be alive somewhere. Uh, but uh, he's, he's smart enough to figure it out. Uh, but uh, most of them people, most of them people have no hope. No hope. Listen, people, in case you had not noticed it, this world rotten. It's getting worse. I don't know how many people has texted me this week, yesterday, three or four just yesterday. Brother Danny, have you heard about that filthy Netflix thing where they're making sex objects out of little girls, 10, 11 years old? I guess y'all have heard about that and the big controversy going on. And I said, yeah, thank God. I ain't seen it, don't want to see it. I ain't got Netflix. I ain't giving them a dime. Amen. I ain't getting my money. And listen, that's a bunch of perverted, bunch of filth. And that's feet. And I told you 20 years ago, if we let this generation of homosexuals convince us they was born that way, the next generation of pedophiles is going to convince us they was born that way. That's what I do with these natural tendencies. Same thing we do with our natural tendencies that ain't right. You, you shut her down. You crucify it. You put it under the blood. You control it. Just like you've controlled your desire to lie. Put it under the blood. Get it right. Listen, ain't no gay gene, brother. Uh, it's a choice you make. And I'm not trying to be ugly this morning. If we're going to ever help these people, we've got to tell them the truth. Amen. Lord help, I thought, good Lord, them people, a bunch of pedophiles. I, you hear about all that stuff like that and you think, good night, and old Nancy Pelosi and all them. Did you know that Gavin Newsom guy, the governor of California, is her nephew? Did you, I ain't going to get into all that kind of stuff this morning about them certain politicians that you see on TV all the time and there's video of them dressed like a woman taking a kid in a motel in California but it won't come out because they're hanging it over their head because if you don't, don't do what we tell you to, we'll expose you. Yeah. Listen, you got to watch the knee. You wouldn't believe the stuff they, that's going on up there. I'm glad this morning that my hope is not down here. And we better, you better get it through your head. Listen, we ought to live here. We've got to make a living. We've got to do the best we can. I hope for the best, but my hope is not down here. We went down there and I, 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 said, uh, I said, well, where's that, where's that road where the movie stars go shopping? They said, that's Rodeo Drive. I said, that's where I want to go. So we went, you turn right up a little hill, Rodeo Drive. And Lord in mercy. And this is 20 years ago, y'all. We had a, a, a pair of shoes like mine, like that one right there. That's supposed to be snakeskin. I don't know if it is or not. But that right there, and they had them $500. I am 79. I'm, I'm too cheap to buy them. I mean, the girls buy them for me for Christmas. <laughs> True. No $79, no shoes. Uh, but, uh, but, that, uh, by the way, there ain't no such thing as a tennis shoe worth $200. No such thing. It don't exist. Hey, Amen. You need to see a good psychiatrist. You said, that'll make me jump higher. I doubt it. I doubt it seriously. Listen, five hundred dollars. They went in this store, and these guys, this guy had these leather jackets, and they were ostrich skin. You know what ostrich skin looks like? Leather. It's real pretty, real soft leather. It's got these little, look like little dots on it. And I said, man. I said, huh? How much does that cost? And the guy said, uh, eighteen. I said, eighteen, eighteen thousand. 18000 for a jacket? It's just like this. His brown had a little ostrich skin dog. He said, that's right. And we laughed. Remember that? We died laughing. And right in front of him, he thought, they thought, they thought she was Ellie Mae. When they heard her talk, they said, are you Ellie Mae? <laughs> and yeah, listen, we think we're important here. We had people out there said, now where is North Carolina? We're really important, brother. Them people don't even know where we are on the map. <laughs> Who cares? Thank God. Listen, it, and, and, and he said, I said, does anybody buy them? He said, oh, there's a guy come in here one day, some movie star and bought 10 of them. A green, purple, 
All the shape, gray, black, $180,000 laid down. And I got to thinking about that and I thought, you know what? You know what? The liquor bottles are laying everywhere. You stop at a, at a, at a red light and these guys just come running out and wash your windshield and, out and then won't make you give them money before you leave. Stick your hand in the window. If you run up them, you'll go to prison. It's a messed up place, buddy. I tell you, this guy, <laughs> this guy's out here uh, uh, walking on liquor, broke liquor bottles. I read a little sign up saying, I want money. One, one, one people was laying there, these hippies was laying there and had a sign up said, uh, uh, need money for pot. Well, at least they're honest about it. That's, for, <laughs> that's what it says. I said, I ain't going to give you no money for no pot. I've probably done a lot of times around here and didn't know it for crack or methadone or something. Uh, but listen, people, listen. This world is crazy. Don't look for your hope in this world. The pillar of cloud led them people and led them people. He said, I have blotted out as a thick cloud your transgressions. There's what we live by. Isaiah 44, 22, I blotted out as a thick cloud your transgressions. Quickly, let me say thirdly this morning, I want to talk about the witness in the clouds. Now the Bible talks about a witness in the clouds in Hebrews 12 and verse 1. Um, it talks about all these people in the book of uh, Hebrews chapter 11. We call it the, the roll call of faith. Now let me tell you who it mentions in chapter 11. Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, uh, Moses, Rahab, uh, Gideon, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets. And then it says in chapter 12, verse 1, Seeing therefore we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. That's a very, very interesting scripture. And I, I know preachers, I've heard it preached all kinds of different ways and I've studied it for years and it hints, it hints to the fact that we are down here running the race for the Lord and the heavenly grandstands surround us. That word compass, that's compass, like, a, like, a, like you draw a circle with a compass, compassed about. And it said that we're compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. All them people that I just named possibly are watching us run our race. I don't know that and I can't prove it, but it sure does. What, what else could it mean? What else could it mean? We're compassed about with a cloud of witnesses. You say, well, they can't see all the bad stuff. I know that God can have it fixed so they couldn't see the bad and just seeing us doing for God. I don't know. He can, he can fix it any way he wants to. But it might be, and I say might, be that they're up there. I mean, Lord in mercy, I can't imagine if Enoch is watching me preach this morning. Maybe I don't know if he is or not. Or Noah, or Abraham, or Samuel, or Isaiah, or Ezekiel, or Daniel, or Hosea, or Micah, or Jeremiah, or all them prophets and Gideon and all them guys. We are compassed about with such a great cloud of witnesses, ladies and gentlemen. Boy, that'll make you want to do right and serve God. I don't know if that. I've heard people say, can they see us in heaven? I don't know if they can or not. I think maybe sometime the Lord lets mom see me. or Maybe that, I don't know that. But uh, I think maybe he might do that. And ladies and gentlemen, we're compassed about. And we ought to do our best. I remember reading about Dr. George Washington Truett. George Washington Truett was one of the greatest preachers in American church history. They lived up until 1944, pastor the church in 1944. He pastored the great First Baptist Church of Dallas, Texas. Up until W.A. Criswell got after him. And then this little, little skinny guy that's on TV once in a while has got it now. Uh, Jeffries or whatever his name is. And Dr. Truett pastored that church. Let me tell you a quick story about George Truett, the great Baptist preacher. He was 22 years of age. Born, uh, born in North Carolina. And his family moved him to Texas. And uh, he, he really was smart and he wanted to be a lawyer. A lot of preachers were lawyers 
when they got saved and then become a preacher. A lot of them were great. Schofield, people like that. I think George, uh, um, Finney, and some of them guys were lawyers. There's something about getting saved. Well, a lawyer changes profession. <laughs> and, and, and a lot of times we think, I want to be a lawyer. I'd like to be a lawyer. I really would. If I was just secular and didn't preach, I, I've always wanted to get in front of a jury and prove my case. I'd love to do that. But I ain't going to school for no 10 years. Uh, 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 I'm, I prove my case for the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what I do every week when I'm up here. I'm convincing the jury my client's innocent. Amen. <laughs> That's the Lord. Well, anyway, he wanted to be a lawyer. And uh, he said uh, uh, his family and his friends thought, you know what, you'd make a good preacher. You'd make a good preacher. You'd need to be in the ministry. He said, no, 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 no. No, that's ridiculous. Well, they moved to Texas, and in 1889, when he was 22 years of age, uh, he joined the Baptist church there in um, uh, White Wright, Texas. And they made him Sunday school superintendent, and uh, he, he became Sunday school superintendent, and once in a while would get to fill in for the pastor when the pastor wasn't preaching. And if the preacher wasn't there, uh, they'd let George Truitt uh, uh, fill in for the pastor and they were so respected the office of the pastor that he wouldn't even get up there behind the pulpit he would stand down here like this and teach and he said I'm not worthy to stand behind there that's the way people used to look at the pulpit and the ministry you didn't get behind there unless you was called of God or God give you something and you was right with God it wasn't no joke that's why they call this standing behind the sacred desk. He said, I'm not standing behind that pulpit. And so when uh, he, he kept going and every time he'd fill in for the preacher, people kept liking it and liking it and said, man, you need to be a preacher. You need to be a preacher. So even without his consent, the church had a business meeting and voted 100% to, to make, ordain him to the ministry. And he hadn't even surrendered to preach. And he said, wait a minute here, wait a minute. They said, no, you've got it, boy, you've got it. It's evident, everybody can see it. You need to be using this for God, God's hands on you. Well, sure enough, he decided to go ahead and, and, and go ahead and, uh, and preach, and he preached, and he preached, and become well-known when he's, by the time he's 30 years old, everybody around the country knew him, and he's preaching all over the place. And, some, he, and uh, he became the first uh, the, the, the pastor there. And some of his men, Jim Arnold was an official in the city and they was going to take him quail hunting one day. So some of the men of the church all got together and went on this uh, hunt, hunting quail out in the field and took their shotguns. And on the way back, George Truitt's gun accidentally went off and shot that man in the leg. And when he did, the man went down there. He was out there in the, in the woods somewhere and he's like, he almost bled to death. And one of them took his shirt off and tied it on there and made a, made a tourniquet there to try to stop the blood. And George, he just went all to pieces. He said, oh, my Lord, look what I've done. He said, he liked to faint and I passed out and everything. Well, the man went to the hospital and died the next Sunday. Died. And George, Dr. Truitt, they said, he said, I ain't never preaching again. How can I stand behind the pulpit when I killed a man in the church? Sure, it was an accident. I didn't mean to, but I can't live. God, I'll never, ever preach again. And he got down and wouldn't eat and lost weight. And he said during this time, he said all of a sudden, Psalm 31.5 kept coming to his mind. My times are in thy hands. My times are in thy hands. He collapsed. And he had this dream that Jesus came to him in his dream and he said, you're my man. Get up. And a few nights later, he dreamed again and he dreamed Jesus come and said, you're my man. I've called you. And a few nights later, he dreamed again. Jesus came to him in the dream and he said, you're my man. I've called you. So he announced that he's coming back. It had been months since he'd even preached. They said the Sunday morning that he went back to the pulpit. Some of the smaller churches in the area literally transferred their whole service that morning to be there in support of George Truett coming back to the pulpit. And they said he walked behind the pulpit that morning. His face was all sunk in where he'd lost so much weight. 
obviously the most terrible thing he'd ever been through. And he spoke. And they said when he spoke, everybody noticed there was a difference in the room. He said you could hear a pin drop in that room. The Holy Ghost fell. The power of God moved. Long story short, he pastored that church till he died in 1944, preached 17,000 sermons, baptized 5,000 people, and he wound up with nearly 20,000 members in that church. And George Truett found out that them clouds might be dark. And you may be going through the worst time of your life. You may think, what's the use? Everything's gone crazy. I might as well just give up. But right on the other side of that cloud is God himself. And he's still got his hand on you. And he still wants to bless you. And he still wants to help your family. Listen, that's worth coming to church to hear, people. Shout, thank God. That's a witness in the cloud. Quickly, I'll say this and I'm through. Jesus went away on a cloud. When he's here on this earth, in Acts chapter 1 and verse 9, the Bible said, And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, a cloud received him out of their sight. Isn't that something? He said, All right, all right now, guys, now I'm going back to the Father. You go back and do what I told you to. And there was a cloud, a special cloud come over, and the Lord just goes right up, and they could see him. Can you imagine? There you go. I don't know how fast it was, but it probably was slow enough for them to watch him go up. And they're standing there like this. And the angel said, what are y'all staring up here for? This same Jesus shall come again in like manner. He went away in a cloud. He didn't go in a chariot. He didn't go in a band of angels. He went in a cloud. That's interesting. That's interesting. The Lord made a witness in the cloud. The Lord made a pillar in the cloud. Jesus went away on the cloud. Guess what? Lastly, Jesus is coming again in the cloud. That's what it says. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 7. Behold, he cometh with clouds. That's what he said. One day, this coming in, in the, in the, at the advent, uh, I'm not sure about the rapture, how all that's going to work out, but we know one thing for sure. Clouds are definitely connected with the second coming of Christ. And the Lord's going to come in the clouds. That's why all them songs say, oh, uh, oh, oh, we'll rise above the clouds. No clouds there. That's why them old songs talk about, oh, they tell me of a home far away. Oh, they tell me of a home far beyond the sky. Oh, they tell Tell me of an uncloudy sky. Oh, they tell me of an uncloudy day. Can I tell y'all something this morning? Listen to me. This is coming from my heart. You hang in there. Don't you give up. There's, we're going to a place where there be no clouds. We're going to a place where our faith will become sight, y'all. We're going to see the Lord. Woo! Lord of God, we're going to see Samuel and, and the prophets and Jesus and the throne and shout around the throne forever and ever and ever. And our faith will become sight. And the clouds are all gone. Oh, they tell me of an uncloudy day. Oh, they tell me. I like the old song that says, when Jesus comes in the clouds, I like the song, there is coming a day when no heartache shall come. No more tears, uh, no, more, no more clouds in the sky. No more tears to dim the eye. All is peace forevermore on that happy golden shore. What a day, what a day that'll be. Listen, that'll put a little hope down in your soul. I know this, our country's gone crazy. I know there's a spirit of darkness over our nation this morning. I know that everything seems like it's going down, but how Hallelujah! Jesus is coming in the clouds one day and take us over the clouds. Somebody said, it will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Life's trials will seem so small when we see Christ. One glimpse of his dear face all sorrow will erase. So bravely run the race Till we see Christ. How about this little song? My Lord knows the way through the wilderness. All I have to do is follow. My Lord knows the way through the wilderness. All I have to do is follow. The preacher told me up there, come on, Miss Dessie. He said, uh, Brother Danny, 
one of the best women in our church. He said, this woman's faithful. She never missed a service. She never missed nothing. He said, she's, she's sick. And he said, I, it just don't, it don't, it don't seem fair. And everywhere I go, I hear people saying stuff like that. What I'm going through, it don't seem fair, preacher. I've tried to live right. You just remember this. Earth is the place for trust. Heaven is the place for understanding. You trust the Lord now. You'll understand it then. Your life's like a puzzle. You got all these pieces in it, and you think, good Lord, what a mess. You ever seen a puzzle? But one day when all the pieces are put together, you'll say, oh, I'll be. Lord, you was working that whole time, and I didn't even realize it. Thank you, Lord. Oh, they tell me of an uncloudy day. One of these days we're going where there'll be no clouds. Ain't no clouds in heaven. It ain't going to storm. There ain't going to be no, no need for faith. There ain't no need for faith without we just even sight. Our faith becomes sight then. Maybe you're here this morning and you need hope. Maybe you need hope. Hope for your marriage. I know people that's biting their fingernails worrying about the mess of our country and I'm concerned about it too. God knows I'm concerned about it. My kids got to live here. My grandkids got to live here if the Lord don't come. But I know one thing for sure, biting your fingernails ain't going to change nothing. You look to the Lord. You look to the Lord. He's the one that'll help you this morning. And he'll bless you. Let's stand together. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Maybe you want to just slip out of your seat this morning. Come on down here to this altar and say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get everything I can right with God this morning. Come on, that's right, that's right. Others, others, just get out of your seat. Come on right now. I, I, preacher, I need that. I needed that. Preacher, I need to trust the Lord through the clouds of doubt that's in my life. Preacher, I need that. Come on. Come on, ma'am. Come on, sir. Come on, mama. Come on, daddy. Come on, teenager. Let's get in this altar this morning. That's right. That's right. Others, let's just get down here and say, Lord, Lord, I know I'm, I'm in the clouds. I'm in the clouds. But, Lord, you're on the other side, and I know you're real. You're the captain of the clouds. You're the captain of the clouds, Lord. Help me. Help me. Help me. You just come on right now. Come on. I know some of you are going through some cloudy time, y'all. Some of y'all going through, maybe you never thought, you said, I never thought my life could be so messed up. Maybe so. But listen, you realize God, he, he knew it. He knew it before it ever happened. And he's going to help you this morning. Father, I pray right now in Jesus' name. Holy Spirit of God, have mercy on us, Lord, we pray. Do what ought to be done. Bless every single person here in this altar this morning. Have your way in our hearts. Now, heads are still bowed and eyes are closed. I hope you're ready to meet the Lord this morning. If you're not, you need to get ready. You can get ready. Won't you let him help you today? Won't you let him help you this morning? Make up your mind right now. I'm going to get right with God, and I'm going to start going to church, and I'm going to get back in there. The devil's done everything in his power to knock you out through the coronavirus, through the through the bad weather, through the hot summer, through all the stuff that's going on, and the devil's trying to knock you out. Don't let him do it. Father, right now I pray in Jesus' name, Holy Ghost, help that one that's struggling right now. God, give them hope. God, give them hope. God, give them hope. I pray in Jesus' name. She's playing this morning, so I'm still praying. Amen. 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 I tell you what you can hope in. You can hope in the Lord. I tell you what you can't hope in. Man. Man will fail you. The Lord won't fail you. Amen. All right. All right. All hearts clear? All right. I believe the rain's over, so it'll be all right. Come on back this evening. Uh, here we're going to have a little time of prayer right before church, and then church at 6 o'clock. The only way to get back in is just get back in. It's like jumping in a swimming pool. Get back in there. You might have to fight a little for it. Huh. No more clouds in the sky. No more tears to dim the eye. All is peace forevermore on that happy golden shore. What a day, glorious day that'll be. Hallelujah. That's going to happen one day. All right, all hearts clear.
Okay. We're going to be dismissed in prayer. Come back at 6 this evening. Bring somebody with you. Be friendly getting out of here, but take it easy. Don't everybody try to crowd out that door at once. We're still trying to keep a little social distance in between us and uh, uh, trying to be careful. As far as I know, there's nobody in our church sick. As far as I know, nobody in our church is, even feels bad. As far as I know, let's keep it that way. Let's keep it that way. Be careful. Uh, don't, don't be taking dumb risk and being careless. And uh, uh, respect each other's space for getting out of here, okay? All right, we're going to be dismissing prayer. I'm going to ask Ethan if he'll dismiss us. Everybody, let's pray.